Uh, welcome to uh, the series we're doing on conversations with philanthropists. As you are aware, we are in the process of setting up a new organization called Accelerate India Philanthropy. Uh, the purpose of AIP is to get uh, ultra high net worth individuals to give more, give sooner and give better. This is really a platform by philanthropists for philanthropists. Uh, as uh, you all know, a lot of wealth has been created and has crystallized in the last couple of decades. And uh, our belief is that several leaders are already doing exemplary work through their philanthropy. I think there is really an opportunity to get many more, really the next generation, to also be part of this ecosystem. So getting more people into the fold of uh, philanthropy. Uh, often philanthropy needs to be sold. It's a latent desire, but working closely with them around their areas of expressed interest uh, and helping them in taking it forward is really the the strategy or, or the mission of uh, AIP. Right. Uh, this is second in the series of conversations with philanthropists about their giving journey. Mm -hmm. uh, today we're speaking with Mr. Vikram Lal, who is someone I respect. Um, he doesn't like being called a philanthropist, but uh, I do share a common passion with him for promoting system reform. So Vikram Uncle, if I may call you that, uh, I'd like to start by thanking you for joining me and would like to begin by asking you to talk a little bit about how and why it all started for you. What's the motivation? Look, uh, I don't think any Indian with, with excess money needs to, to really look for motivation. You only have to go out on the street and you see the kind of poverty that prevails in this country. And you have to only open a newspaper to see what kind of dissonances there are in our society and how difficult it is for our, our government in all its forms to really do justice to its task. So there is ample scope. Anyone who wants to, uh, you know, sort of pro contribute to the improvement of the situation or whether it is poor people or the system or any way, yeah, there's plenty of scope. And sure. what happened to me was that I, I was sort of heading towards retirement because, uh, because I had given all the responsibilities to other people. And I then thought that this is the time for me to do what I've always thought of doing. Sure. So I started with uh, two major projects. One was the Shroff Eye Hospital in Darya Ganj, which was almost, what should I say, almost closed. And we've revived it and it's become the <laughs> institution in North India for eye care. It, it is doing a great job and it's very dynamic. So that is the one thing. And the other was that we took up uh, a set of schools in the really backward areas of Alwar district in two blocks. And there we made those schools into good Hindi medium schools. We could have offered an English medium, uh, let's say, uh, uh, this uh, channel also, but the trouble is that in those areas, anyone who, who can teach English is just not going to go there. Okay. And, and it's a big problem to find even the normal teachers, science and uh, maths and other things. So anyway, that has been running for the last 20 years. But in the meanwhile, with additional resources, uh, I put them all into different ways, uh, basically into governance. Right. That I find is the most, it has the most potential to improve things. Sure. It is how many years has it been now? Well, I would say that uh, it started about 25 years ago with these two projects and then gradually it uh, uh, sort of revved up to various others. And so it's more than, I would say that even for the major sort of change in direction, etc. That was about 15 years ago. And you mentioned that governance uh, is an area that you believe is most critical now. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could you just tell us what, what, how you define governance and how did you stumble upon this? Well, the way I stumbled on it was there was uh, a, a person who is still very active in these areas. It is Madhukar. Mm-hmm. C. Madhukar, who was later with, uh, uh, which is that? I forget the PRS name. PRS. Yeah, he was originally with PRS. He started it. And then Umidiyar. Yeah. Yeah, then Umidiyar. That's right. So he told me that here are a couple of people, and that was included PRS and Vidhi Center. Yes. So I looked at that and I discussed it with several people, and I figured out that just giving money to run a school or to run some program like that, you can only help that many people. It's a hundred, a thousand kids who are in that school. That's it. Whereas if you can improve governance, you can improve the entire state education system, for example. Yeah. As you are already doing in, in a couple of cases, these are, these are massive uh, sort of uh, efforts which which can make a huge difference to the to the education of children in that state. Yeah. I think that and when you say governance, do you look at it as making? Do you think of it also as leverage because government is spending a lot of money already? Yeah. And as philanthropists, we can only it's a drop in the bucket. Yeah. So is it also about? making the system more efficient, more effective and supporting that in a positive way? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Now, that is to the extent that it is an uh, area like education or healthcare. But when you have the big uh, uh, problems like judicial reform, yeah. like police reform and uh, administrative reform, there are many others and they all need... Uh, a lot of input and a lot of, how shall I put it, a lot of pushing before anything really gets done. We've been trying, for example, in in judicial reform for many, many years. But so far, we have to just softly tread on uh, in this area because the judiciary is highly sensitive and it has enclosed itself in these very high walls. Yeah. One can get in there and no one can really talk to them as normal people. Which is a and when did this shift happen? I mean, this realization to move away from direct funding to more the governance type work. That was about 12, 15 years ago, 12, 14. So fairly early. I mean, you, you did yeah. some project and then fairly early. That's right. And because, uh, so I want to just switch gears from the approach and the area, which is is really governance, which you've defined as being the key priority, to, I mean, clearly we know this is very high payoff if it works, if you can get the system to work better. Um, But in terms of identifying and assessing the NPOs or the NGOs working in this area, what is your method for doing due diligence on them? Is it more a function of the entrepreneur? Do you look at the body of work that they've already produced? What are the key things that you look at? I don't know if it is right or wrong, but I have restricted the uh, operation of our foundation only to myself. That means I decide all these things and I don't have anyone else to help me to do that. So I gather information on any NGO that I feel is might be worth supporting. I talk to people who are in that you know, have dealt with this particular NGO. And then I decide. And I decide on the basis of a lot of it is trust. I don't go into fine financial detail and and then, you know, sort of go into all kinds of uh, reports, etc. I get a quarterly report generally. And I look at that carefully. And I write back. So that is how I deal with it. And considering that the bigger NGOs that I am dealing with are not that many, there may be maybe 15 of them, that it is not an overwhelming task. And how many um, organizations in total would you fund uh, today? Pardon? I didn't get there. 
I said, how many organizations would you fund? How many are there in your portfolio, your philanthropic portfolio? Hmm. Total number of organizations. I, I deal with roughly 45 or so. But some of them are very small. Some of them are very small yeah. and that is only because someone I know well has recommended someone and I don't want to just say no. And it's only a matter of a little bit of money. So I just uh, support them because if, if there is someone who is standing in a sense shortly for them, then that gives right. that kind of uh, leeway to, to, to support that entity. Right. And is your standard method, like for instance, you mentioned that you get a quarterly report. Do all, even including the small ones, send you a quarterly report? Do you write back? How often do you meet them? What's your way of engaging with them? To potentially, and I know you trust them, yeah. but also in terms of adding value uh, to them, how do you think about that? I meet the uh, the important ones once a year in any case. Right. And that happens anytime during the year. It's not as if there's a scheduled uh, meeting. And others, the smaller ones, I don't bother about because that really doesn't make any sense to spend a lot of time on that. Yeah. These are issues which are relatively small. There may be a, a neighborhood school which uh, someone is running and just needs four or five lakhs in a year. So that's not, that's not uh, something to spend a lot of time on. So, but the other ones, the big ones or even the medium ones, we get reports every quarter. Yeah. Yeah. And then we discuss. It's on the phone, it's on Zoom, it's on uh, by email. Right. And one barrier to giving has been that, you know, a lot of people say that there's no credible information, there's no transparency in the sector. They suspect that the, the efficacy may be low. How would you respond to that? Because you've obviously gotten over those barriers. Uh, yeah, I think that there are any number of reasons for not giving. And if one cannot overcome that resistance that is built into each one of us, it's not as if it is something that uh, only some people have. It is, you're always worried that am I giving it and is it going to the right place? Is it going to be used properly? But then I say that you have to trust and after a year, after two years, after three years, you take a call again. But to say no without knowing, I think is a, is a very weak way of looking at this whole uh, area. And as far as the outcomes are concerned or results, uh, whether it's in the medium term or long term, how do you measure results in a practical way? I mean, they report to you, but what are you looking at in particular? See, if you take a typical, no, not typical, but because these are all individual uh, NGOs. If you take PRS, for example, yeah. their basic brief is to inform all legislators right. in parliament about the bills that are being put forward and how they're going to impact the population, how they're going to, what is their effectiveness likely to be? And various other things. They give a brief a six pager on, on these issues. Yes. And they don't have something that will tell us that they have now achieved something. The achievement is entirely on information. And we just hope that this information is going to make discussions, not only in parliament, because in parliament, as you know, the anti-defection law has killed all discussion. But what does happen is that inside their own party, uh, let's say, committees, there is a view that is a person can express there. And that is the only place where these this information that is going into the legislators uh, can be of any use. And there is a demand. I mean, what I find from PRS is that there are people who reach out to them all the time. Yes. And after every election, every five years, there is a reduction in the number of people who know them. 
and then it gradually builds up over the first six months, and then they are back to where they were earlier. Yeah. And in any case, they are getting to be very well known by now. Yes. So in this case, what I have been doing is asking uh, Mahadevan to go out and go to the states. So this he started some years ago. And now a lot of the states are also involved in, in this process. And the states do so much of the legislating and the uh, governing that it's extremely important that the, that the states are included in any kind of, uh, uh, let's say, information sharing. And uh, so I gather that you're obviously comfortable even if the end outcome is amorphous. Because you have a belief that at the end of the day, an informed member of parliament or MLA, uh, yeah. there's a huge value to that. Whether it's whether discussion happens at the party level, in the legislature, even their own decision making, uh, yeah. they're more informed. Absolutely. Uh, and, and then the, what you're looking at really, the metric is how well can PRS, how good are they informing them? And... So the supply side and then the demand side is their demand pool as well. So the fact that 300 MPs may read their four-page briefs and the fact that MPs reach out to them with questions, yeah. ask them to prepare notes, that gives you comfort. That so they are a leading walk. They are the most trusted, uh, non-partisan, apolitical force in informing members of the legislature. That's right. right. By a long term. So very pragmatic sort of approach. You're less concerned. I mean, it's it's a bet. But look, at the end of the day, this is very very important in our country. You know, you uh, can you can also be very sticky and say that look, until I can see metrics that give me the confidence that this is actually having some serious impact, uh, you know, it doesn't make any sense for me. Yeah, now, yeah. that is in certain situations is just not feasible. Yeah. And, and I guess you rightly so you're saying, look, at the end of the day, they can't influence how parliament functions. I mean, if yeah. there is an anti <clears throat> law, or there's a whip that's in our parliamentary system. It is what it is. I mean, we hope that there will be some reform in the way it functions. But as it exists, even, can we add value? I mean, you're, so you're pragmatic enough to say, look, that bold reform is outside our control. Yeah. Let's do what's within our control, in a sense, with the existing system. That's right. That's right. And other areas, like you mentioned, say, uh, very difficult areas, like judicial reform or police reform. Uh, again, a lot of people would shy away because they'll say, look, these are very entrenched systems. Whether it's the police or the judiciary, very difficult to change. But at the same time, we know the ROI is potentially very high because our yeah. safety, security and law, justice is critical in any country. So how do you think about, you know, again, what the results are that you would look at and, and whether you want to continue funding in this space after a while? Do you get tired at some point saying, look, we tried, but it didn't work? I mean, what's your approach there? So far, I'm nowhere near that point that I can say that. <laughs> sure. Because I feel that there are incremental changes and, and progress being made by the various NGOs that who are dealing with, let's say, judicial reform. Oh, see, I had spoken about Vidhi earlier. Then there is Daksh in Bangalore. Yes. And there are various other entities. There's Civis in Bombay. Yeah. And, uh, there is Agami. Yeah. Many others who are working on this problem. And someone is going to a high court in the south, someone is helping a high court in the north to come to terms with this whole thing and to modernize. Now, considering the situation or the condition in which our judiciary has put itself in, it's uh, you have to pussyfoot around this whole thing and you have to go very carefully. Yeah. Because if you, if you step on the sensitivities of a, of a high court judge, that's the end of that. Then you set yourself back rather than making any move forward. Yeah. Everyone who has who is working in this area is moving cautiously. And there's no choice. But let me just say that for me, 
the two verticals that make a society a just society a civilized society is the judiciary and it is the police police including uh, the the whole gamut you know it is the uh, investigation and prosecution and all that now the thing is that in this uh, judicial reform is not a simple task it is a it's a complex thing which which is made even more complex by our condition as i had already said so you have to just go on and on and on and i think that that there is some change taking place and that's why i have chosen these two because without that without uh, both judiciary and police becoming modern and for the people you see police today is still colonial i mean we all know that they only work for their masters they don't work for the citizen i mean that's how they're taught that's how the act is so anything else they would be in trouble so they just simply have to do that and so something like the police i mean are you looking more at structurally how do how does one change the act advocacy work or do you also simultaneously look at some degree of capacity building sensitization community involvement etc well i really shoot from the shoulder of the various ngo that are engaged in this so i am not doing anything on my own yeah yeah so there is here common cause there is chri there are others who are working in police reform and as you know that uh, common cause had got a verdict in 1996 so you can see that in 25 years there hasn't been any progress zero so there are certain things that happen and certain things that don't happen okay they they gave us right but that was also not good enough yeah. so one goes on i mean there you have to find other you know chinks in the armor somewhere or the other so yeah. you keep trying because this is not something that you can say oh well i have tried and i it doesn't work no it doesn't it isn't like that this is a must do yeah in my book yeah and i just want to come back to you mentioned governance is a key priority so when you look at the landscape i mean obviously this legislature judiciary police there's of course also government expenditure in the social sector and how do you make that more effective other other aspects uh, of governance uh, beyond this that you look at well the only one i can uh, talk about immediately is <clears throat> is the uh, let's say under trial prisoners hmm. now just to give you a, a small statistic about 50% of criminal cases are actually the the person is found to be guilty in other words 50% roughly are found to be innocent true now if that is the case you got people sitting in prison for 3 years 6 years 10 years for no fault of theirs they are innocent true and there is no there is no uh, what shall i say uh, uh no leeway given to them they are treated just like convicts they have to live in the same kind of awful circumstances they got the same awful food they have you know bathing and toilets etc are really something that i mean i wouldn't like to even talk about them frankly because it is really awful what they go through yeah and this as an innocent man to have to go through that is really a calamity in my mind yeah. so you you have this large portfolio of 45 orgs you said some are small you don't engage with as much yeah but where do you um, believe that because you have a wealth of experience from the corporate sector but now also understanding these issues much more deeply where do you believe that you provide the most because you work solo as you said without a team yeah. yeah um where do you add the most value to them in terms of whether it's shifting i think is it more strategy is it more around how they build a great organization is it all of the above i think in some cases it is 
discussing a particular issue and and helping them to come to a a, a better understanding and also then action in that area right whatever it might be right i i see that happening often with the ngo that i am dealing with right then there is uh <clears throat> very often just plain encouragement i mean it, it does a lot for for people who are up to their necks in whatever they're doing and yeah. i have to keep in mind that these people generally would have had a very different career they could be corporate honchos or whatever you call them uh, they could be earning 10 times as much but they are stuck in this thing because they believe and who am i to say that their belief is wrong i don't uh, i cannot possibly say that so it is really building on their belief that is uh, the purpose that i or the direction that i follow right so for any new philanthropist or someone you you mentioned that look the barrier to coming in because there's lack of credible information or maybe this trust one can get over that it doesn't require doing that much homework you need to meet the people you can check with others rely on other even informal sources and then your feeling is that even coming people coming from the corporate world or people who made money yes um, if they listen and they have empathy and they care about these issues there is the ability to value add by really understanding the problem and being a little bit more action oriented coming up with the how of what needs to get done pragmatic uh, approach and then of course encouragement and and maybe networks also connecting them with friends other people is that the way philanthropists should think about a lot of their value add as it were because people do want to with without i mean you're an unusual case where you do this full time now but for many people this may be something they do with 10% of their time or 5% of their time mm-hmm. so what advice would you give them in terms of expectation they should have in terms of because they want to add value beyond just giving the money yeah <laughs> i would say that uh, they must they must sort of take what especially those who are doing this as altruists that they should take their word for what they are saying and what they hope to do they should not start with disbelief and that is what i think can open their minds to supporting various uh, people ngos especially if you go into the detail as to why that person is doing what he's doing if you find that out you'll find it's it's quite amazing the people who've already decided that while they've been in university they could easily go and get a big job somewhere but they have just decided that this is what they're going to do and they do it for 5 years 10 years 15 years and and they they don't think of just quitting that's not that's that's really amazing yeah so i i completely agree with you it always amazes me it's i took the easy path where i was in the corporate world made money and then i stepped away and like you go but you know people when they make this decision when they're very young yeah. they could have so many opportunities yeah. to they are mission driven they make sacrifices they persevere I mean there's so many frustrations it's so difficult yes but is. i see people working for 10 15 20 years doggedly and these issues are more complex than any issues i faced in the corporate world that i really admire yeah the work that people do i mean it's really heroic work and so i guess you're right just being able to keep an open mind and to discover those people and trust them is really what people need to look at uh, in terms of working with government what is your take on on that i mean how do you look at working with government supporting government how should philanthropists sort of think about this well i stay away from government frankly yeah so i don't have any experience working with government on on philanthropy but there are others who have been doing it uh, and that is good but you have to be much larger in terms of your portfolio or your ability to fund 
and you have to have a whole organization which can follow up and deal with this one and that one and the other so that needs a different kind of organization and mindset so i mean i do want to support orgs that in a way have set up whether it's a project management unit to support like we've been together working on yeah school reform in up you know at the governance level uh, so you would support organizations that are partnering with government uh, to affect change i would if if again uh, this whole thing is that if i find that the other supporters are are of a similar mindset as i am in other words if i can put my faith in them then i would i have also <clears throat> helped others sure. uh, i just want to switch gears and to talk about some of the challenges and learnings around that so if you could just share candidly what have been your biggest challenges in this journey my biggest challenge i suppose is the constant i mean this is in the last few years constant shrinking of the of the flexibility of funding agencies because of tax changes and other such things which are going on all the time and that makes uh, it rather difficult to to do what you would like to do and what has been possible earlier whether it is now suddenly uh, funding agencies can't give money for uh, corpus uh, it is disallowed as in income tax then there are various other things that keep happening all the time you know one thing or the other so that for me has been both irritating and challenging so you have to find other ways of dealing with it yeah and with the benefit of experience so with hindsight would you have done anything differently when you when you were in the early stages of uh, your journey i may have got into governance related uh, ngo earlier uh, instead of after 8 10 years of of uh, philanthropy or funding i may have done that if i had done that i think i would be happier i would be more satisfied but today of course that's history so it's not something i can change yeah and what keeps you going with your sustained philanthropic efforts and what what excites you most i i feel that you know and why i don't like being called a philanthropist i think this is a this is a it's an obligation that we have people with money in a country with no money i'm talking about the lower 50% of the population it is an obligation you have to do something and there's no choice in my mind there's no choice you have to go out and spend the money that you don't need so even that there is a there is a sort of what shall i say a stick for that that means or a measure for that that is what you don't need you give uh, so i think that is what i have been trying to do all yeah. around and i mean a lot of people when they are thinking of giving one of the things they struggle with I mean, even i still young you struggle with is the issue of when you say need i mean obviously each person defines it differently yeah. in terms but do you think of it as you know there's obviously what you want to do for your family and in your case it's your business that your son is now running and the shareholding etc but then beyond that Uh, it's really what you need in terms of personal expenses that what you're saying and then the rest of it you want to give up. i mean is that what's your framework and think about how much you would give and over what time frame yeah i try and see assess what is the increase in wealth both of the foundation and my personal wealth as it increases i then take a decision here that i will give more this year or a bit less or whatever it is then i keep measuring that and the finally in march i take a the end decision but that is how i try and do that so that 
I am not accumulating more money, and I am giving it away because there is plenty of need, and uh, so that is what my own measure is. Yeah. And because a lot of people really own businesses, and it's really their shareholding, which is their primary wealth. Yeah. Um, is it? Do you think of giving out of the income, which may be dividends, or do you also, at some stage, look at, you know, selling a small portion of the shareholding, uh, or is that something that you believe shouldn't be touched? Because at the end of the day, a family needs to have some degree of control over the business. Look, I got out of this some time ago because. i distributed or my wife and i we distributed the shares of our organizations the companies to our three children so she and i have zero shares in our yes. in our company so whatever we have came out of a small sale of shares before we did all this yes. and we we divided amongst our family and that is what i am using for so everyone has a limited amount at least my wife and i have a limited amount and we then use that for whatever we want so it's almost you carved out what you are going to give away and that wealth grows and then accordingly you adjust the annual giving yeah that's your portfolio almost that's right. no in advance that's right. and what is your observation around where we are i know you don't like to use the term philanthropy but you know in terms of this whole giving back um amongst wealthy people wh- what is the state of this today in in india i think there are a few people and that is a really minuscule lot who do things other than religious giving uh the standard uh, you know the normal education and healthcare kind of giving anyone yeah. who tries to do something that is good for society in a very positive and active manner that you find very very few people mm-hmm. and i'm run into the same people uh, wherever you turn as far as governance or other such issues are concerned there there are only a few people there may be 10 in the whole of the country hmm. and that is the sad part i find because people have to get the courage and they have to try and understand what is the need right yeah no it's it's true there are some areas that uh, i think are completely neglected um and people often don't i mean i think you've thought about it deeply and you said you stumbled upon it after a few years yeah giving because it is the ultimate i mean if if the governance issues get resolved many of the the state anyway is responsible for education and health and and yeah. to some extent the private sector it's a mix of the private sector and the state but it's That's really uh, if the governance improved the outcomes would would naturally uh, improve um, improve that um, and and then there is certain other agencies like you said like police and judiciary that any civilized society the important institutions mm-hmm. part of any absolutely um and are there i mean obviously you have a certain way of doing this which is you know you like making as you said grants to these somewhat smaller or impactful in a space where there aren't too many other mm-hmm. things, but there's potentially big impact you don't care as much about the direct impact in the near term you know it could take a long long period of time and then you try to find new approaches if something isn't working but are there i mean that's one archetype mm-hmm. giving that you have are there other archetypes that you have seen that you would encourage other people to possibly examine as they start thinking about their finance well one way is that you scan the whole world or let's say the indian uh, world and see what makes the most sense to you and pick one one area it could be water it could be ecology it could be any number of things yeah. you take that you could make that into your thing and you put all your resources into that right that could mean funding 
agencies that already exist or you're taking the step of starting some and running that for this particular purpose yeah. so there are this is another one or you could restrict it not to one but to two verticals yeah. rather than one so these yeah. are various possibilities yeah. so just focus is what you're saying and through that you could have multiple approaches which is yeah. you do some grant making where you see some gaps you may even start your own thing i guess it also forces you to read more about the issue so you may also say there's some missing gaps from the research standpoint that need to get covered uh, it's so just focus yeah. itself is Absolutely. critical in terms of going yeah yeah and in terms of engaging uh, family or the next generation how involved is your family in, in your philanthropic efforts well i keep them informed but they are not deeply involved because i have told them that they should find their own uh, direction right. and so for example my youngest daughter she is seriously into ecology and and uh, uh, animals etc so she is doing things with wwf and with other agencies uh, working in this area there is uh, mm, uh, and the others also do similar thing you know they they find their own uh let's say what they want wish to do yeah. as as also my wife she is she is doing things with uh, for people in god forsaken places in the himalayas where they have no access to so many things right. so she is helping a bunch of such villages and and things like that so they everyone is deciding on his own there is no common family thing each person their own passion yeah. their own interest yeah they're pursuing and you just share with each other what you're doing what you're learning yeah and yeah. is that in a structured way do you all meet uh, no once a, no it's just informally around the dinner table yeah and one call someone and ask what what is going on here and i think like that because sometimes we wish to support the same ngo and so uh, one would like to know what is the uh, situation vis-a-vis -vis my family member and a lot of people you know who are looking at giving they one of the issues they think about is are there benefits to engaging the family uh, are there some downsides i mean i know it's a very personal decision but any advice you may have i mean uh, does it lead to greater commitment will they end up giving more if the spouse and kids are involved does it make it less professional how do they balance the these two things the i think that one has to find a method which does not uh, get the people involved into any kind of disputes or misunderstanding i mean that is something that hurts the family and it doesn't do the work that you're doing any good so i feel that's why i have not insisted on anyone doing what i'm doing because it makes no sense to me everyone has a head on his shoulder and they can do what they feel best or happiest doing mm -hmm. as long as they are actually doing it i mean that is the only thing i put a little pressure on i see yeah And, and before we close i wanted to ask you in terms of you know as you think about um you know we are trying to reach out to people who are wealthy and get them to to give more give sooner give better your if you'd like to share any sort of closing comments around again the importance of this work like you stated at the beginning and uh, why people should be doing this earlier maybe not waiting till much later uh, in life and and others they can look at for inspiration in terms of role models uh, in india well, i think think that uh, my personal belief is that it as i said earlier that it's an obligation on everyone with money to spare it's an it's an absolute obligation it is not something that is relative or it is something that comes and goes it is an absolute responsibility of the people with extra money to give it away mm. that's what i believe 
and how you do it and to whom you give it that's another matter that is something that you have to figure out and that is exactly what i tell my family also that i started telling my family and they are doing whatever they can do yeah right so what else you said something else i think i said other role models people can look at in yeah. india well i admire a couple of them very much one is the nilekani husband and wife yeah and then is uh, cyrus gazda and there are a couple of other my name retention is very poor so i i keep forgetting things but but these are there are again half a dozen people whom i admire there sure. and and i work with in a sense with them on several issues no, thank you so much for for sharing this it's been a fascinating i learned a lot uh, through this conversation even though we know each other and you're an inspiration for me and uh, I know you will be for many others. So I, I know as people watch this, uh, it will spur a lot of thinking. But and I hope that you will be open if people want to reach out to you to uh, uh, speaking with some people in person. It would really give them the chance to to think through in their minds what they should be doing and how they should be pursuing their journey. So thank you for being part of this conversation. You're most welcome.